So I'm here with Carlo Fusco. I'm Jay Mitchinson Schwartz. We're going to be talking tonight in our third podcast about uh, bringing the video component into things and storytelling. So we talked in previous weeks about um, basically what uh, what it means to put together a story, how it's how you can use technology to emphasize. Uh, uh, certain parts of the curriculum and, and really help to bring it out. We talked about audio last week with um, uh, podcasting and this week of course we're bringing that video component into it. So um, Carlo I'm going to ask you a few questions about um, using podcasting with a video and how to set that up basically in the classroom. Okay, uh, thanks Jane. Uh, I've actually brought a few props today. So the, the standard point and shoot camera uh, probably the, the cheapest device you can get and it works really well so students can uh, bring their own in they can be purchased uh, inexpensively and uh, all you need is a camera uh, a memory card and a USB cable and you can start collecting video if you start uh, actually asking students what they have with them uh, the iPod touch tends to be quite popular as well and there's a half decent camera on here that uh, students can use to, uh, to record video and even better, because it does have a, a Wi-Fi component, then it's going to be a lot easier to transfer video to different locations. And some students, well, depending on the grade you're teaching, will also have a cell phone. And cell phones, again, just, uh, just as good to uh, collect video. There's a, a camera on it, and many of these also have a USB connection, as well as, as Wi-Fi or, or data. So you can actually transfer your files that way. Uh, just a couple of tools that uh, I've had a, a great deal of success with students using. Okay, and I had one uh, as well, the uh, flip phone, or not flip phone, rather the flip camera. These, um, this one was actually 60 bucks on sale. Uh, you can get them from usually between 60 and 100 bucks. It's got a little flip out on the side here for the, uh, the USB that you just plug it right into the, uh, there it is, plug it right into the computer works on AA batteries, so cheap and easy for a teacher to go out and, and maybe buy a couple of these or for students, of course, they having their, they're having their own iPods like you said as well or, or their own cameras too, so it's a pretty easy do and pretty cheap. Yeah, excellent, excellent tools and you know Kodak makes them as well that can be purchased relatively cheaply and uh, just a lot of different ways to capture video now. So what are the benefits? Let's, let's start talking about the benefits here. To kids. Well, I like the idea of video um, for students because there's always a rehearsal component with it. Uh, you know, it's not like old days of film. With digital, with digital media, they can record uh, themselves over and over and over again. And when they don't like something, it's easy to delete, start again. Um, I did a, a sample video that you'll see later tonight um, with my son. And the interesting thing about that was this first run through. I could barely hear his voice. He's one of those shy, quiet kids. Did not hear him. He was. He did what he had to do, but I couldn't hear him. After that, uh, that take, we we did it again, and he was getting much more comfortable. And I actually asked him to do it one last time. And then the third take, his voice was strong. It sounded professional, and his comfort level was had reached the point where he started actually injecting bits of humor, and his personality actually started to show. Well, the presentation is great. It, it teaches them uh, exactly how to come out of their shell, for one, but um, how to speak in front of an audience. And I think what you were saying about him trying it over and over again is also that that's like self-editing. You're as you do it a couple times over and over again, you realize what works and what doesn't work. So if you have that opportunity because you're taping it, then you really get to play that back and see those parts that maybe you could have done a little bit differently and tweak it. And again, bring your own personality into it. So there's tons of benefits that way, definitely. Good for the shy kid, too. But what I really liked as well is we looked at uh, the curriculum that he's following. He's, uh, he's in grade four now. And uh, in grade three, I know he was doing some procedural writing. And so the idea that came to me was, why not do a procedural video? So maybe the, the writing component could be the script. And that would be the procedural writing. And then allowing students to, to make the video. And that would add that next component or you know add that production value or you know increase the quality of the product definitely and my daughter's in grade eight she's doing procedural they just uh, mixed it with media as well and she did a cooking show 
for again doing the procedural but same sort of thing they right. did the script in advance and they got to try it out a few times and everything with video too so yeah this is an easy do and it's fun for kids as well and like you said they got the cameras and everything right there i i think the other thing it does too i noticed um because i've been teaching comtech for a long time um even outside of the english area i had uh students in my classes where teachers would tell me okay well Good luck this this kid's gonna have a hard time in your class because they can't write scripts and that kind of thing i found they were actually able to tell stories naturally using video because it seemed to be their language so that whole differentiated learning comes back again too so great for the shy kid great because it's fun great because it's differentiated learning there's so many different benefits for kids and again we keep going back to the cost saving the things they've already got at home right all these you know the ipod and everything that you were talking yeah. about well, the thing is, I think a lot of teachers, um, when you start thinking video, and, you know, we grew up in an age when, when film was expensive, getting it developed was expensive, and I think we're reluctant to, to approach the idea of video. And uh, just today's, today's equipment is cheap, it's easy to access, it's available, and uh, I think that barrier, that cost barrier has disappeared, and I think we should be embracing it more and allowing students to, to use it. Definitely. And we were going to talk a little bit of too about um, how to go ahead and capture this and how to transfer it, all that kind of procedural okay. thing too, because I think some teachers might not know what to do once they have the video file. So what do you do? How do you edit this thing? How complicated does it need to be? Okay. I, I, I guess uh, I, sh I should also point out now we do, uh, I am, we have been uh, collectively writing uh, some show notes uh, with all of these. And I think we, uh, I think we're going to, once we're done here, we're going to finish that up and, put in a few of the links to some of the services we like. Um, one of the hardest things that we came across uh, when we were actually doing this video was how are we going to get the video from the device into the computer so that we could edit. First idea was, oh, let's email. But then we remembered a lot of email services have a limit on how big the file can be. So if it's less than five megabytes, it'll work, but over that it doesn't. Um, the file we ended up making was over 100, so that wasn't an option for us. So we then looked at the next one, and a favorite tool uh, that we use here in our home is Dropbox, so that we can actually put a file in a Dropbox folder, we share it with everyone, so everyone can access the file. So um, my son dropped it into his Dropbox folder, which he shares with me. I turned on my computer, and uh, the Dropbox folder on his iPod connected to the Dropbox folder on my computer, and we were at, I was actually able to pull the video out of that, and we were actually able to edit. Of course, a USB cable could have handled the problem, but I thought, let's think about how students can transfer this, uh, work with these files, not only in school, but be able to take them home as well. And that is just one of the solutions. Well, 24-7. I think you had a few to add. 24-7 for sure, right? Being able to edit. Sometimes they have another program they might want to use at home that may even be better than what we have at school, or maybe they just want to use the basic tools. It can be, you can just have so many more options for students, which helps to engage them as well. When they know they've got options, they're going to go with that project a lot, a lot better. Um, the other one I was thinking of was uh, Google Files in, in under, well, under Google Docs, if you just upload under the regular files and transfer them over, that can take it 24-7 as well and, and move it to any computer that way, um, PC or Mac. So um, lots of options there, very easy to do. Yeah, it's all yeah. good. And I think the, the next part is um, how, do the, how do students edit? Uh, you could spend the money on, on Premiere, you could spend the money on, on Final Cut, but most computers have built-in editing software, so nothing more than Movie Maker on a Windows machine or iMovie on a, on a Macintosh. Uh, you don't need to do a lot of heavy editing. It's just getting the pieces together that you want, put some credits at the end, and uh, you can be done. There's one other thing I was thinking, too. When it's in video and if it's procedural, you can actually see with detail exactly what um, somebody's using with their hands. Like When we see this video of Max, you're going to see just his hands working on origami and that's something you would not be able to do with 25 or 30 kids sitting in their desks they wouldn't see it so no no this makes it so much easier to be able to pull it up on that big screen and for students to see exactly what's going on too so lots of benefits that way yeah and what's nice about it too is it's the replayability of it all uh, when you're done making the video you start looking at the different ways to publish and you can go back again to a traditional method. You could burn it to a DVD and then the student could bring it home. But why not upload it to other services? You can you can upload it to YouTube, Vimeo. Um, 
if the kids are over 13 and uh, your school has access, upload it to Facebook. All of a sudden, not only are they going to be able to share it with friends and family, they can view it themselves at any time they want. Uh, other places that you can put it is you can take that file, upload it to a, a blog, um, upload it to a website, and uh, like you said before, Google Docs, what's nice about that, the students can put it there, there's a, a link that they can share with uh, family and friends so they can keep their video private and only share it with those people that they want to. That's right. But they can also take it and embed it as well if they happen to do uh, web pages or anything like that too. They can, they can take it from there. So, so many different mm -hmm. uses and that chance to play with different audiences again, um, you know, in a, in a publishing out there in the real world, all those opportunities are there. And it comes back to that idea of uh, producing or, or, or writing and, and publishing for a real world audience. You know, it's not just all of a sudden something they're doing in the classroom for a single mark. It's, yes, there's still going to be a mark, but now it's part of their digital portfolio and it's something that they can be proud of and something that they're going to carry through life and something they can always look back, oh, this is what I did when. Um, you know, just recently I, I watched that movie Super 8 by, you know, that Steven Spielberg had produced. And as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, okay, this was uh, sort of a, an insider type of movie because it was about his life as a child learning about filmmaking. Mm, yeah. So the movie is really about his childhood, and it was the idea of not having that uh, material available to, to show, but all of a sudden remaking a movie to show that to people. Right, right, yes. If that made any sense at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it did, definitely. <laughs> the storytelling, being able to track that and have something progressive, right? It's, um, I know out West they've been doing uh, some work with portfolios where they, they do it as benchmarks. So that, like what you were saying, you can go back in time and see. And that uh, you're able to track progression um, of the individual student too. So that, that can be very, very helpful as well. Great. Should we take mm -hmm. a look and, uh, and see the procedural video that Max has done? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at it. Max is uh, his newest discovery uh, at Christmas. He received a book on origami and has been unable to stop since. So tonight we're going to see uh, one of his creations. Um, so it's called Max and the Whale. So let's go see that. Great. Hi, my name is Max, and today I'm going to teach you how to make an origami well. This is what it's going to look like when it's all done. So first you're going to need to start with a square piece of paper. Flip it to the right side, take a corner, and fold it to the top. I'm not a professional, and it may rip while I'm making this. Just open it back up, take the side, and pull the side into the middle crease line. Sorry, it's a little sleepy on this table. Um, Then you are going to have to make sure there's no white showing. We don't have to, but it turns out better. Make it sharp. And then you're going to flip it over and take the top bottom point to the top. Just like this. And then you're going to flip it back over. This is where it sometimes rips, so if it does, I'm just going to keep going. Get a little finger in there. Mess it up. So you're just going to take the side, pull it out, and push down. Again, make sure the tips are sharp and this is ever in, just take your finger and push it out. Again, try not to have too much white. 
little bit of weight. So, okay. Now, you, this is where you're able to take either side. Take the bottom corner and fold up. And just like, it would be like this, but then you just pull and it turns off. Then you're going to have to flip it over. Make these little two flaps point down. Flip it over again. And then you're going to take the top corner down. About the size of your pinky finger away. Or index finger. Doesn't matter, just a finger. And Some people, yes, your thumb is a finger. No, don't use your thumb for this. Your thumb is will be too big. Alright, now you're gonna take this piece of paper and fold it in half. Then you may be able to start to see the whale shape. So we're gonna take the tail, open this up a little bit, pull a little bit up and push in and just close it up again. Then you're gonna make the fins, final step. Um, you're just gonna push back a little bit, make it just go down a little bit. Uh, maybe along this crease line would be good, a little further out. Then on the side, do the same thing, just match it up, and there you go, you've got an origami wheel. Now you've got two little whales that can swim away in the sea. Okay, so great video that we got to see there from Max doing the procedural, and you could definitely see that he was much more comfortable having practiced it a couple times around, coming out of his shell, a little bit of humor there with the whales that are um, up, you know, racing off into, I, I guess, somewhere into the water <laughs> is fantastic. So um, next week, I guess we're going to talk about publishing and uh, again about uh, how to put this up and, and which types of audiences that we could uh, have students uh, showing their work to and how to go about that entire process. So thanks for joining us. Carlo, thank you very much. Fantastic. And I'm Jane, and we'll see you in our next podcast. All right. Good night.